So in case you haven't guessed, my name is Penina Taylor. Am I allowed to start now? Yes, please. Okay. <laughs> and my name is Penina Taylor, and I was born into a secular Jewish home. Now, what that means is that what my Judaism meant to me is it explained why I had a big nose, why I talked with my hands, and why I like Chinese food. Which, by the way, I have to explain to the people in England. Did you know that English Jews do not have the same obsession with Chinese food that American Jews do? I can't figure it out. But anyway, my Judaism had no meaning to me. It was something ancient and archaic, something to be remembered maybe, but certainly nothing to be desired. And it was within context that I grew up. Now, I had a traumatic childhood. My parents were divorced when I was four years old, and I suffered a tremendous amount of abuse at the hands of a friend of our family. By the time I got to high school, I was beginning to wonder, you know, what's the point of it all? I mean, if there's nothing out there bigger and more meaningful than all of this, and you know, if life is about nothing more than all of this pain, then what's the point? I had gotten into some very bad behaviors in school. Um, I was uh, skipping classes, I was doing drugs, I was smoking, I was drinking. Uh, I had a really bad crowd of friends. And my life began to slowly slip away. My life had spiraled into this abyss from which I thought that there was no escape. So I began to start asking these questions, as I said. And one day, a classmate of mine in school said to me, you know, Penina, your questions are no different um, the questions that we all have. She says, we all have these questions and there is an answer to your question. There is a solution to your dilemma. She said, what you need is to have a relationship with God. Now, I thought about that for a minute and it kind of rang true for me because, like I said, I had been raised in a secular home, but when I was in fourth and fifth grade, I and my sister to attend an Orthodox day school in the community that we lived. I went there for fourth and fifth grade. The problem is that what I learned there didn't really stick. Perhaps some of you might be able to identify with this because I quickly learned that what happens at home stays at home and what happens at school stays at school. My first day of school, I learned about something called Shabbat. Actually, they called it Shabbos, but whatever. Shabbat. And I was just so excited about it, you know? I had never heard of such a thing in my life, and I came to my mom to tell her about this thing called Shabbat. And you know what she said to me? She said, don't tell me how to run my life. A few weeks later, I was in school, and it was a Monday morning, and all of my friends were so excited talking about the things that they had done over the weekend, and I had also done something really fun over the weekend, because I was being raised by a single mom, and we didn't have the money to do kind things, you know, but this particular weekend, my mother had taken my sister and I to an amusement park, and I was so excited to share with my friends about how I had gone to this amusement park on Saturday. <laughs> well, my teacher caught wind of what I said, pulls me out of the classroom, says, don't be so chutzpahdik. I didn't know what she was saying. I thought maybe it was like some kind of a disease or something. You know? <laughs> but clearly it was something I didn't want, right? And so I learned that what happens at home stays at home and what happens at school stays at school. So back to the story with my friend. She tells me what you need is to have a relationship with God, right? I thought back to those days in Hebrew school and I said, you know, that sounds like the truth. And so, at the age of 15, I was introduced to God and to Jesus because my friend was a born-again Christian. Well, my newfound faith gave me the strength to make all sorts of changes in my life. I stopped drinking, I stopped smoking, I stopped doing drugs, I stopped hanging around with this bad crowd of kids at school. I actually started attending class, and my mom watched as my life began to turn around. And she thought to herself, when I went to her with my newfound faith, as all good Christians are wont to do, my mother thought to herself, well, if something should have such a profound effect on my daughter's life, it must be the truth, right? And so I brought my mom and my sister to Christianity as well. Well, I went off to Bible college. I got certified in e something called Evangelism Explosion. I don't know if any of you are familiar with the program. I got a lot. This is, this is such a great audience. It's the first time anybody <laughs> understands what I'm talking about. I was a counselor for the Billy Graham Crusade. I'll probably say, uh, yeah, okay. And... Uh, and I started dating my best friend's older brother. 
Now, my best friend's older brother was an ordained pastor. He had graduated from Moody Bible Institute in Chicago, which is one of the premier missionary training colleges. And um, we were dating, and we were starting to get very serious. We started talking about marriage. And so I thought to myself, you know, I've always had this dream that my father would walk me down the aisle when I got married. Now, a lot of people think that sounds like that's a strange way to phrase that. What do you mean you had a dream that your father would walk you down the aisle? Well, I hadn't seen my dad except one time in 15 years. How is he going to walk me down the aisle when I get married if he doesn't even know me? And so I decided, I asked my mom if it would be okay for me to write a letter to my dad to invite him to come for a visit. Now, to my surprise, my mom said yes. And, of course, this is in the days before texting and email, right? So I wrote the letter. She sent the letter. And to my surprise, my father agreed. And so at this point, we're living in Florida. My dad is living in New Jersey. And he came down to Florida to visit us. And he started to get to know my sister and I better. And while he was there, he also got to know my mom better. And he decided that he was falling back in love with my mom. And so he decided to ask her to remarry him. Well, my mom said, you know, I'm also kind of falling back in love with you, but we've got a problem because, you know, I'm a born-again Christian and you're a secular Jew and that's not going to work. We can't do that, right? And I said, wait a minute, not a problem. I'm certified in evangelism. I know what to do here. No problem. So I went and I bought my dad a special Bible from the bookstore and I started to share with him verses from the Bible. I took him to church and my dad became a Christian too. Now my mom and my dad were able to get remarried after having been divorced for 15 years. And seven months after my parents got remarried, my dad walked me down the aisle when I married Paul in the church. Well, my husband Paul was enlisted in the United States Air Force, and we ended up getting stationed in England. And while we were in England, one day I was praying, and I began to get this feeling like God was telling me to light candles on Friday night. I wasn't sure where that was coming from. I mean, my mother didn't light candles. My grandmother didn't light candles. I mean, my great-grandmother must have lit candles, but I never saw her do it. But I really felt like God was telling me to light candles on Friday night. So I went to my husband and I told him about this and I said, what do you think I should do? And he said to me, well, if you believe that this is what God wants you to do in your service to him, go ahead. So I said, okay, well, <clears throat> if you're going to light candles after needing candles, what do you need next? Right? Candlesticks, right? This is very funny. I love the fact that I get to talk to all these different um, audiences because when I'm talking to a bunch of high school girls and I say, if you're going to light candles, what do you need? Usually the girls will say candlesticks. If I'm talking to boys high school and I ask them, if you're going to light candles, what do you need? What do you think the boys answer? Matches. Matches. That's right. Exactly. Matches. Uh, when it's a mixed audience, they usually are like, huh? I don't understand the question. But um, no. so, so besides candles, you need candlesticks, right? So I remembered that I had inherited my great grandmother's candlesticks. So I went over to the buffet and I opened the drawer and I pulled out the candlesticks. And next to the candlesticks was a Maxwell House Passover Haggadah. Now, Maxwell House, some of you are familiar with that. Maxwell House, of course, is a coffee company, and every year for Passover, they run a special line of kosher for Passover coffee. And as part of their shtick, they would sell this Passover Haggadah, you know, that well, they would give it away. They would say, you know, buy two of our jars of kosher for Passover coffee, and you get a free Haggadah, right? So why did I have this Haggadah in the drawer? Well, I told you my family was secular, but we did one thing Jewish each year, and that was Passover. Now, our Passover Seder was probably not like anything that you guys would recognize as a Passover Seder. This is what our Passover Seder looked like. We would come to my grandparents' house, and we would walk in, and my grandparents would greet us. My great-grandmother would say, good yanta, if I had no idea what she was saying, but that's what Bubby said. And my father would pull out this stack of Maxwell House Passover Haggadahs that he had collected. He would pass them out to us. We would sit down and he'd say something like, okay, everybody open to page 15. So we would open the Haggadah to page 15. He would read one paragraph. We would sing the chorus to Dayenu and then we would eat. 
Now, we did have a piece of matzah because it was Passover after all, but we also ate a whole lot of other foods that you wouldn't think of as kosher for Passover. Well, but that was my memory of this event, and it was a fond family memory. So when I got married, I asked my, my grandmother if it would be okay for me to take one of these Haggadahs. And of course she said yes. And so I had this Haggadah next to the candlesticks in the drawer. Now, what does that have to do with lighting candles on Friday night? Well, I remembered that inside the front cover of the Haggadah was the blessing for lighting candles because we light candles at the beginning of every Jewish holiday. And at the bottom was the special line to include for Shabbat because sometimes Passover begins on Friday night. And so using the Maxwell House Haggadah, and God bless Maxwell House, not only did it have it in the Hebrew and in the English, but it had it in the transliterated Hebrew, which is the Hebrew and English letters. And I began to light candles on Friday night using this Passover Haggadah. So here I am, I'm lighting candles on Friday night, and meanwhile I'm still going to church on Sunday. A little while later, one day, my husband comes running down the stairs. Penina, Penina. Of course, that's not what he called me, but Penina. He said, I was reading in the Old Testament. Now, I don't have to explain to you guys what Old Testament means. When I'm talking to a religious Jewish audience, sometimes I have to explain to them what that means, right? That basically it's our Jewish Bible, our Tanakh. They've taken it and they've retranslated some of the verses and they've changed the order of the books. But basically, it's our Tanakh. Anyway, my husband says, I was reading in the Testament, and I came across a verse where God says that there's something that the Jewish people are supposed to do forever. He said, and if forever really means forever, right, like in the rest of the Bible, then if I'm going to be right before God, my Jewish wife and my Jewish children need to do these things. So now you have to understand in a 45 minute, one hour lecture, there's no way that you can get the entire picture of what's going on here. And sometimes people will say to me, wow, you were all over the map religiously. And I have to explain to them, no, not really. If you step back and you take a look at the big picture, what you see is two people who were on a journey for truth. We wanted to serve God in truth. So here's my husband and he comes to me and he says to me, there's something that God told the Jewish people that they're supposed to do forever. And you know, you and the kids, you're Jewish. Now, a lot of people are kind of amazed that my husband was more aware of the fact that I was Jewish than I was, not that I didn't know. So I said, okay, go ahead, shoot. He says, well, it says in the Old Testament that God told the Jewish people that they're not supposed to eat pork or shellfish. I said, wait a minute, no more ham and cheese sandwiches? He said, no. I have to think about that one for a minute. But of course I agreed, because if this is what God wanted me to do, then certainly this was what I was going to do. And so, here I am now. I am lighting candles on Friday night. I'm not eating pork or shellfish, and I'm going to church on Sunday. Well, a little while later, I was reading in the New Testament, which I probably don't need to explain is the Christian part of the Christian Bible. Um, but I was reading in the New Testament, and I came across a verse in Corinthians that talks about head coverings. Only it's kind of confusing in the English. Is it saying that a man is supposed to cover his head and a woman isn't, or a woman is supposed to cover her head and a man isn't? What's it saying? And so we decided to invite the pastor of our church, because we didn't have our own congregation at that time. We decided to invite the pastor scholar, and of course the New Testament is written in Greek, right? So he comes to the house and he sits down and he says to me, well, you know, he did pass it. Yeah, I know, that's why I asked you here. He said, no, really. he said, even in the Greek, he said, it's very hard to tell which word is modifying which word. I said, okay, pastor, what do you think it means? He said, well, what I think it means is that married women are supposed to cover their head when they pray. But I can't teach that because women nowadays, they don't want to hear it. Well, if you're somebody who's seeking truth and you believe something's right, women nowadays not wanting to hear it, enough reason to not do it. Of course not. So I decided to start covering my head when I prayed. I started with a hat. The only problem is, like I said to you, I'm a highly distractible person. So 
I don't like labels, so that's my way of saying, you know, explaining my situation. Um, so I would put my hat on when I wanted to talk to God, because prayer is talking to God, right? And when I was done, I would take the hat off and I would go and I would put it down somewhere. But then when I wanted to talk to God the next time, I first had to remember where I had put the hat, right? So I'm kind of like, um, hang on a minute there, big guy, just, just a minute. And I would go and I would find the hat. Only by the time I found the hat, I forgot what it was I wanted to say God. So I decided there had to be a better solution. I got a scarf. And I put the scarf around my shoulders. And when I wanted to talk to God, I would put it on. And when I wasn't talking to God, I would leave it on my shoulders. Only thing is, I discovered that I talked to God throughout the course of the day, right? I'm sure that you guys can identify with this. So on went the scarf and off went the scarf and on went the scarf and off went the scarf. And finally, I just said, oh, forget it. And I decided to wear the scarf all the time. So now here I am. I'm lighting candles on Friday night. I'm not eating pork or shellfish. I'm covering my head all the time. And Going to church on Sunday. That's right. You guys need to wake up. I know it's late, but yeah. I'll try to be more energetic. Going to church on Sunday. Well, something began to happen inside of me. Back then, I couldn't have told you what it was. Now, looking back at it, I call it my spiritual identity crisis. Because what happened was my Jewish soul, my neshama, began to be at war with my Christian beliefs. You see, I believe that any time that a Jewish person begins to take on the mitzvot, begins to do the commandments that God gave the Jewish people, they open up a conduit between their soul and God. And there's a communication that starts going on. And so I started to experience this restlessness inside, and I had no clue what it was about. Well, short time later, my mom and my dad came to visit us in England. Now, last I had left my parents, they were attending a nice little uh, Assembly of God church in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I'm helping my mom unpack her suitcases, and one of the suitcases is full of Judaica items. Sitters, tzitzit, kippot, shofars, all kinds of Jewish stuff. I said to my mom, Mom, what's the Jewish stuff? And she said to me, well, while we were in Pittsburgh, we met a group of people who were born Jewish, who believe in Jesus, and they found a way to synthesize their Jewish heritage with their Christian faith, and they call themselves Messianic Jews. Now, I had never heard of that term before, but I had heard of Jews for Jesus, and it intrigued me. So it intrigued me, and I thought, maybe this is the solution to what's going on inside of me. So when we got back to the United States a year later, we sought out a Messianic congregation. And my husband and I started going to this Messianic congregation, and we very quickly, we, we were in leadership in all of the churches that we were at up at that point. We quickly were incorporated into the leadership of the Messianic congregation. Um, and I was leading women's ministry, deaf ministry, music. I was uh, leading worship sometimes, and my husband was a uh, deacon in the congregation. Why they chose to use the word deacon, I'm not sure, but anyway. Um, and so we were very active in this congregation, and my parents, now we're in Maryland, okay? My parents are in Maryland, and my parents, and they said the closest Messianic congregation is over an hour's drive away. Maybe we should start our own Messianic congregation. I mean, Paul's ordained an ordained pastor. Penina, you lead all these ministries and stuff, and, you know, Mom and I are really administrative. So together, we'd make a really great team. So... My husband and I went and did what we should do, which is we went and prayed about it, and we decided God's will that we start this Messianic congregation. But I thought to myself, you know, if we're going to be doing something called Jewish, because it is actually Messianic Jewish, right? Maybe we should know a little something about Judaism, don't you think? So I decided to go to the Jewish bookstore to get a book on Judaism. No, the Jewish bookstore has a lot of books on Judaism, but I found one that had an intriguing title. It was called How to Run a Traditional Jewish Household. It's written by a very modern Orthodox woman named Blue Greenberg. And in it, instead of calling herself Orthodox, she used the term Torah observant. Okay? So I thought to myself, wow, you know, I like the sound of that. Torah observant. Maybe that's what we need to be. Maybe we need to be Torah observant Messianic Jews. So I went back to the 
<laughs> I went back to the Jewish bookstore. Yeah, you thought that was the end of my story, right? <laughs> I went back to the Jewish bookstore and I bought the Kitzer Shulchan Aruch, which is the condensed code of Jewish law, in English, of course, but I read through that three times. Then I went back and I bought this giant art scroll book on keeping kosher. Not the little one, the big one with all the charts to try to figure out how we could have a kosher meal and food cooked at non-Jews' houses and whatever. And I went back and I got books on purity and keeping Shabbat and basically everything you could learn about being an Orthodox Jew from a book, I learned. Now, you cannot learn everything there is to know about being an Orthodox Jew from a book, but what you could, I did. And we began to make changes in our lives. I started to dress modestly. My husband and my son started wearing a kippah and tzitzit. If you had run into us on the street, you would have thought we were an Orthodox Jewish family, just like any Orthodox Jewish family in Borough Park or Jerusalem or Myerland. You would not have also known that we were Christians or Messianic Jews. Well, we ran the congregation with my parents for about three years. And then, as you can imagine, running a joint leadership program with your parents can be a little tense sometimes. And my husband and I started to get burned out. And we decided that we valued our relationship with my parents more than our position as leaders of this congregation. And so we decided to leave. My parents continued to run the congregation for a few more years. And we ended up in a Messianic congregation this story a little short. If you want to know more details and especially about my husband's part of the journey, I'll have to give a plug to my book. I have two books over there. One is my story and the other one is basically a counter-missionary Jewish Christian polemics book. But anyway, we ended up attending a uh, Messianic congregation in Northern Virginia. Now just a little bit of a geography lesson. You have Washington, D.C. Everybody knows where that is, right? North of Washington, D.C. is Maryland and south of Washington. Washington, D.C. is Virginia. So we lived east of Washington, D.C. My husband worked in Virginia. We figured we were going to move to Virginia. We went to a Messianic congregation in Virginia. But one day there was an event at the Messianic congregation in Baltimore, and we were at the event. And after the event, there was food, because let's face it, you have Jews, you have an event, you have food, right? Sure. It doesn't matter that the Jews believe in Jesus. You have Jews, you have an event, you have food. And so we're standing around after the event and there's this really nice blonde haired lady who is trying to convince me that the food is kosher because she can tell by looking at me that that might be something that's important to me. And so she, she stops mid-sentence and she says to me, how would you like to buy a nice big five bedroom house in Upper Park Heights in Baltimore? Now you have to understand something. Upper Park Heights is the heart of the ultra-Orthodox community in Baltimore, okay? I don't even know how to compare. It's probably not a, anything like Meyerland. It's, it's like Mea Sharim in Jerusalem, um, like uh, Williamsburg in New York, if you've ever heard of it, right? It's, you know. So she says, in fact, I believe God wants you to buy this house. Now, obviously, I was used to people talking like that, but um, I did think that maybe this woman was a few slices short of a full loaf, and I'm not one who's into confrontation, so I figured I'd have to find a way to get out of it, right? So how am I going to get out of it? Marriage 101, blame it on your husband, right? So I said to her, hey, you know, I said to her, um, I need to talk to my husband. I figured what was going to happen. No, we're in Virginia. We're headed to Virginia. Baltimore's nowhere on the map. Are you crazy? And then I'd go back to the woman and I'd say, my husband says no, and that would be the end of it. Now, that was what was written in the script. However, my husband didn't read the script. And my husband says, sure, we can take a look at it. Now, I have it on good authority. That was the first and last time I was ever speechless. But after picking myself up from shock, I went over to the woman and I said, my husband says that we could take a look at it. So we drove up to the house in Baltimore. And the funniest thing happened when we drove up to the house, I suddenly got this feeling. Something said to me, you're home. Now, I wasn't sure whether it was the proximity of the other Jewish souls in the area or the men walking down the street in black hats and black jackets. I don't know what it was, but something said, you're home. And we went in and we looked at the house. 
we fell in love with the house because first of all it was a really big house it had originally been small and had been pushed out in several directions so it had a lot of character but it was three times the size of the house that we were currently living in where I was homeschooling our four children in the dining room and the walls were closing in on me and so we fell in love with the house but we did what a messianic couple in our situation would do we went back to our congregation and we asked them to pray concerning as well as to whether or not we should buy the house. Of course, they had a separate prayer meeting for the purpose. And would you know it, all 250 members of the congregation unanimously agreed that it was God's will for us to buy this house. Why? Because who better to convert Orthodox Jews to Messianic Judaism than Messianic Jews who look and act like Orthodox Jews, right? And so with the blessing of our congregation, we made arrangements, we bought the house, and we moved in. Now, we had a little bit of a colder reception than we were expecting when we moved into the neighborhood. You know, we had always heard stories, you buy a new house, move into a new neighborhood, people come by, they introduce themselves, they bring cookies, right? No, none of that. I didn't find out for many years that when this woman had bought the house three years before, she had taken it upon herself to go knocking door to door to all her Jewish neighbors, and they were all Jewish, to let them know, just in case they didn't know, that they were all hopelessly lost and going to burn in hell forever because they didn't believe in Jesus. So you can imagine how the neighbors felt about this woman. And you can imagine how ecstatic they were when she told them that she had sold the house, until she told them that a nice messianic family was moving in next door. They didn't mean to be rude, they just didn't know what to do with us. I mean, you know, in America, Jews know how to live next door to non-Jews, but what do you do when a Jewish family is moving in next door whose sole purpose, pun intended, is to convert you and your children to some form of Christianity? And so they didn't know what to do with us. But my husband and I started thinking, Saturday's coming, Shabbat, get in the car, and we drive to the Messianic congregation that is not walking distance from our house, nobody in the community is ever going to listen to a thing that we have to say, right? So what are we going to do? Well, we prayed about it, and we decided that on Shabbat, we would attend one of the more than a dozen Orthodox synagogues in walking distance of our house, and during the week, we would go to midweek Bible study to get our fill of Jesus. Well... Which shul do we go to? Which synagogue do we attend? We decided, well, we found out that the rabbi who owned the bookstore that I had been going to all, those, all that time, he also happened to be a community rabbi. He had his own shul. And so we decided that that's where we would go. Fortunately for us, it was a little bit of a walk, so they, they didn't know who we were. And uh, Shabbat came, and we decided to go to this shul. And we had the most amazing quite incredible. Everybody there was really, really fantastic. Um, they helped me to follow along in the Torah reading. They helped me to follow along in the prayers. You know, just really, really wonderful. In fact, it's very different than some of the stories you hear about people who come back to Judaism and, you know, they, they, their first experience maybe in the synagogue wasn't so great because the only person that said anything to them came up to them and said, hi, how are you doing? You're sitting in my seat. <laughs> But uh, may you never experience that. But in this case, I didn't experience that at all. It was really quite an amazing reception that I got. Now, for those of you who are familiar with the synagogue service, when a new family shows up on the other side of the mechitza, where the guys are, what happens when there's a new guy in town? Anybody? He gets called up to the Torah, right? He's given an aliyah, we call it. Right? He's called up to the Torah, and he's going to be allowed to give a blessing on the Torah. So, you know, they're looking at my husband and my three boys. They're all wearing kippahs. See, my husband's wearing a talit. He looks like he's praying from the sitter. So they offer him an aliyah. And my husband says, no, I'm not Jewish. Now, I don't have to tell you that all over the country there are non-Jews who are attending Messianic congregations, learning how to look and act like Jews, learning how to make the blessings on being called to the Torah, and even in some cases learning how to read from the Torah, right? And then they go and they visit Orthodox congregations and they're given an aliyah and instead of being honest like my husband who is a man of tremendous integrity, 
they just make up a fake Hebrew name and nobody's the wiser. They're being counted in minions and really they're committing a crime against the Jewish people. Now, I know that sounds kind of harsh, but at the very least, they're not being honest and it's not right. But like I said, my husband is a man of tremendous integrity and he said, I'm not Jewish. A little while later, we, and we started to get to know people in the community and whatever. I'm not sure what they thought about him, but um, about two weeks later, my husband says to me, my husband, the man of tremendous integrity, he says to me, you know, we need to tell the rabbi what we believe because it's going to come out eventually. He said, and we don't want him to feel betrayed. We don't want him to feel like we've been lying to him. So we need to tell him that we believe in Yeshua is what we called him, of course, Jesus. And I said, I don't think that's a good idea. I don't see this ending well. But he insisted, and I relented, and we invited the rabbi to come talk to us. Now, knowing that my husband wasn't Jewish, and I was, what do you think the rabbi thought we wanted to talk to him about? Conversion, of course. So the rabbi comes in and my husband starts telling him what he believes. And the rabbi stops him after about a minute and says, well, wait a minute, you don't believe that anymore, do you? To which my husband says, yeah. Well, in the moment it took for absolute shock to register, register on the rabbi's face, I began to see my world implode. Because we had just bought this big expensive house, we couldn't just turn around and sell it. And were homeschooled and if they kicked us out of the shul who were my kids going to play with and maybe they were going to take our pictures and put them on a poster and post them on lamp posts going down the street you know warning missionaries i don't know maybe my kids were going to get beaten up i didn't know what was going to happen and so i started to cry so the rabbi turns to me and he says well what do you believe now I'm here to tell you that at this point in my story i've been a christian for 17 years I was certified in Evangelism Explosion. I served with the Billy Graham Crusade. I was responsible for bringing hundreds, if not thousands, of people to Christianity. It wasn't like I didn't know what I believed. But in that moment of emotionality, when the rabbi said that to me, all I could do was say, Rabbi, I don't know what I believe. Please, please don't kick us out of the shul. You guys awake? <laughs> so he looked at me. And he said nothing at all. And I like, I, to me it seemed like it was an eternity. It probably was only like 30 seconds, but I thought he was never going to say anything to me again. But when he did, he said to me the most important thing that anyone has said to me anywhere along my Jewish journey. He said to me, you are a Jew no matter what you believe, even though what you believe is not Judaism. He said, let me be clear. It's not Judaism, it's not kosher, it's not okay. But you are a Jewish woman who is responsible before God to fulfill the mitzvot, the commandments that God has given the Jewish people. He said, therefore, I'm going to allow you and the children to continue to come to the shul. He did ask that my husband not come for a while because he didn't know what to do with him. But he said, there's one caveat. He said, I want you to talk to a guy from an organization called Jews for Judaism. Now, I had never heard of Jews for Judaism before, but I'm not stupid. Jews for Jesus, Jews for Judaism, they probably don't like people like me very much. But what was I supposed to do? It was pretty clear that if I didn't agree to talk to this guy, the rabbi wasn't going to allow me to continue to come to the synagogue. So I agreed, but I agreed kind of like you agree when you're downloading software to your computer and up pops this box with the terms of agreement, right? And it's got all these words in it, right? And like, who actually reads the words in the box? Where's the one geek in the room? Come on, show me your hand. No? Nobody? One? Uh, all right, anyway. Nobody reads the words, right? We just look at the box, click I agree, and we move on because if we don't, we can't finish downloading the software and oftentimes we've paid for it. So like, what would be the point of that? So I agreed thinking, ah, oh, I'll put him off, I'll ignore, he'll forget, you know, I'll never really have to talk to this guy. Things will just stay the way they are. Well, that's what was written in the script. I don't know what it is about you guys and not reading the script, but the rabbi didn't read he kept calling me and saying, Panina, you're going to call this guy from Jews for Judaism? You're going to call this guy? Panina, you're going to call this guy? And at some point, he made it pretty clear that if I didn't call him, 
things might change. So I picked up the phone, even though I hate the phone. I called Mark, that's guy's name, Mark, and uh, an appointment. So Mark goes over to my house and he walks in and he says, okay, let's talk about why you think Jesus is the Jewish Messiah. And I'm thinking to myself, you start every conversation this way. <laughs> well, anyway, he comes in, he sits down, my husband throws out a verse to him and he is perfectly happy to do the talking and I'm perfectly happy to let my husband do the talking. And Mark says, okay, well, let's take a look at that. So Mark opens, he pulls out a Bible, he opens the Bible to Isaiah and he says to me, now Panina, you've read this verse in its context before, right? I said, of course I have. I read my Bible every year from cover to cover. How many of you have ever read the entire Jewish Bible, the Tanakh, all of it, from cover to cover, at least once in your life, in a language that you understand, which for most of us is English? I'm sure it would not shock any of you how few hands I get raised when I say that. And so then I offer this challenge. If you're sitting in this audience and you're someone who has never read the Tanakh, all of it, I would challenge you. It is, after all, your heritage, your history, your inheritance, and your future. Don't you think you owe it to yourself to find out what's inside? And so I offer that challenge and I challenge them to read the Bible at least once in their life. I even created something called uh, People of the Book Challenge on Facebook. I did up a yearly schedule so that, and you can print it off, although I haven't redone it for this year because I'm on a speaking tour, but it doesn't matter. You can print it off. It's basically assuming that you read the Parsha every week, that uh, it divides the rest of the Tanakh into basically two chapters a day, and you can use it as a checklist to um, keep track of what you've read. But anyway, so he says to me, you've read this verse in its context before, right? And I said, of course I have. And he said, but wait a minute, when you read the Old Testament, he said, you see Jesus on every page, right? I said, of course, it's all about him. He said, well, I want you to do me a favor. He said, just this once, I want you to put yourself in the Jews of those who were living at the time that Isaiah wrote it, which was 700 years before the destruction of the Second Temple, 700 years before Jesus ever walked this earth. He said, would you be willing to do that for me? And I said, sure. And so for the first time in seven years, I read this passage without having the bias that it must be talking about Jesus. And guess what I discovered? wasn't talking about Jesus. In fact, I discovered, of course, that it wasn't a messianic passage at all, and that the verse in question had to mistranslate a very important word in order for it to say what Christians said it said. Well, we only talked about one other corollary issue, and Mark went home. But he left me with an awful lot to chew on. Because if this one core belief that I had held for 17 years was based on a lie. What else did I believe was based on a lie? And so, over the course of the next few weeks, other I was in his office and I said to him, well, what about this verse? And he said, well, let's take a look at it. And I said, what about this verse? And he'd say, let's take a look at it. And I didn't take his word for it either. I went back to the pastor, I went back to the congregation, I even went on to Jews for Jesus' chat room, which I don't think they have anymore. They kicked me out because they thought I was a plant because I was asking questions and I really really did a lot of research I can't even share with you in the short time that we have tonight what I went through but most of you can identify with it and one by one the bricks of the foundation of my faith were being pulled out right eventually the entire structure had to collapse and then I was faced with the daunting task of trying to figure out what it was I did believe. I mean, if this one core belief that I had held for 17 years was based on a lie, what else did I believe was based on a lie? And so I started to say, you know, is there still a God? Do I still believe in God? And if I still believe in God, what does that mean for the Old Testament? Is it really God's word to the Jewish people or, or not? And, and if it is, what does that mean for me as a Jewish woman? Do I need to be Torah observant or could I be something else? 
Now, since I'm standing here talking to you today, you could probably figure out what my conclusions were. I decided to convert to Buddhism. <laughs> I just did throw that in to make sure you're still awake because we're on now. But uh, no, obviously I embraced Torah observant Judaism. Now, I had a problem though. At this point I have four children. They are 6, 8, 10, and 12 years old. And my 12 year old son is less than a year from Bar Mitzvah. And I knew that if he still believed in Jesus, there was no way that the community was going to Bar Mitzvah him. So I started to talk to him about what it was that I had discovered. And I said to him, you know, we used to believe this. And Judaism actually says that it means this. I want you to take a look at it and decide for yourself. Now, because I was homeschooling him, I was able to give him these things as assignments. <laughs> and um, he went through them. In fact, I had a funny incident where... Um, at one point, I think it was Daniel 9 that I had given him to look at, and he, I, I looked in the assignment drawer, and there was a piece of paper, but it only had two lines on it, and it basically said, theologians haven't been able to solve this question for 2,000 years. You expect me to? <laughs> I had to give him an A for that, of course. <laughs> well, anyway, so my son decided that Judaism was the truth, and we arranged for him bar mitzvah in the community. Now, during this time, I was sharing with my husband and sharing with my parents about everything I had discovered. Now, with my dad, it was really interesting because he's running a messianic congregation and he's got a real stake in the things that I'm sharing with him, right? So, every time I would share him, share a verse with him and, and my new Jewish understanding of what that verse meant, he was like, I'm going to prove you're wrong. And he would go back and he would research and he would do all this stuff and he would come back and say, you're right. And so, bit by bit, he began to change his faith, and he began to change the way he was teaching in the congregation. And little by slow, the members were dropping off two by two. In fact, by the time we got to the bar mitzvah, I think he had four members left in the congregation. Well, we had the bar mitzvah party. My son's birthday is in the, in the summer, and so we had a backyard bar mitzvah. Anyway, we did everything that we had to do to make sure it was kosher. And I look out the window from the house and I see in the backyard my husband, uh, sorry, my father is talking to Mark because we had invited Mark to the bar mitzvah. And uh, a few hours later I look out the window again. My husband's still, my father's still talking to Mark. Not my husband, my father. My father's still talking to Mark. Well, he was getting clarification on the last few points he had questions about and by the end of the bar mitzvah party my father and mother had decided to come back to Judaism. Well, thing is I'm married to a guy who is a pastor and I call him a Southern Baptist preacher boy and that's the closest I'll ever get to a Texas accent. I don't know what that was but anyway. <laughs> Really? Okay. I'll have to work on it, especially if I'm going to be back here on a regular basis, right? i got to make myself understandable to the local right. people. Yeah. Um, nobody can figure out where I'm from. That's okay. I don't know either. Um, but anyway, so my husband, you know, like a lot of people, and I'm sure that many of you can identify with this, a lot of people who either become B'nai Noach or convert to Judaism, they'll tell stories about how certain things just never sat right for them. Either they couldn't handle the virgin birth or the idea that their grandma was in hell or whatever it was, but my husband didn't have that. He was a true believer. He had no questions, none whatsoever. And now I went and pulled the rug out from under everything that he knew and everything that he had planned for his life. He said, you know, as a pastor, even if we didn't have our own congregation, having his wife reject Jesus was like having his right arm cut off. And that was a pretty powerful statement when he said that. So I was sharing with him about all of the things that I had come across. And it was really interesting because up until that point, we had the most amazing marriage. We never fought. Not that we didn't disagree because that would be weird. But we never ever fought. And now everything he said offended me and everything I said offended him. And we were fighting all the time. In fact, everybody was convinced we were going to end up divorced, not because of the difference in our faith, but because of all the fighting that was going on, right? After I came back to Judaism, one day we're having a fight. I'm probably taking my like, you know, typical fighting stance or something. And we're having this fight, 
And I said to him, oh, you just say that because you're a Christian. <laughs> to which my husband says, actually, no, I'm not. I said, what? He said, no, really. He said, over the last two years, you have given me enough reason to doubt the validity of the New Testament. He said, I don't believe in the New Testament anymore. I don't believe in Jesus. I'm not a Christian. He said, but I don't necessarily believe that Judaism is the truth with a capital T either. And I certainly am not going to trade one flawed religion for another. And so at that point, he became a Ben Noach, a Noahide. And our status in the community changed. And we began to attend classes in the community together. And he began to start thinking about the fact that God had given him a Jewish wife and a Jewish children for a reason. And four and a half years after I came back to Judaism, my husband decided that God that Judaism was the truth with a capital T and that God had given Jewish children because he was also supposed to be Jewish. And my husband converted to Judaism and Paul Michael Taylor became Pinchas Moshe. We're married under the chuppah at the Eskayim Center in Baltimore for any of you who know the Baltimore community. Well, not long after that, I approached Jews for Judaism and I said, look, I've been speaking since I was 16 years old. Um, I'm trained in evangelism, and there's not that big of a difference between evangelism and Kirov, right? <laughs> and I said, but most of all, I have a personal tikkun, a repair to make. I said, because I have been responsible for bringing hundreds, if not thousands of people, I mean, who keeps track of these things, right, to Christianity. Now, only a small percentage of them were Jewish, but still, I want to devote the rest of my life to helping Jewish people to develop a meaningful, deep, and relevant relationship with God within the context of Judaism so that when they seek spirituality, as most of us do at some point in our life, they won't have any reason to go outside of Judaism. I said, but more than that, I want to devote my life to helping Jewish people come back to Judaism to see what it is that they have lost. And so Judaism said, sure, yeah, we'd love you. And I worked for them for a year and a half. At the beginning of that, um, my parents discovered Israel. Now, let me explain how it works in the Jewish community normally. I use that word with trepidation. Normally what happens is when your kid graduates high school, they go off to Israel for what we call the gap year. Okay? They study at a seminary or yeshiva for a year. They fall in love with Israel. And then they because we make them. <laughs> and then they find their beshert, they find their other half, and they get married. And they discover that they too fell in love with Israel. And so they go and make Aliyah and they move to Israel. Once a parent has more kids in Israel than in America, they make Aliyah as well. Right? That's the way it normally happens. But we've been here for together, right? You have probably gathered that my family does nothing normally. So my parents said, see ya, and they got on a plane and they made Aliyah with Adam. <laughs> Long story short, a year and a half later, my husband and I and our kids decided to make Aliyah and move to Israel. That was nine years ago. And while we did, when we did that, I decided to start my own organization called Shomre Emet Institute for Counter Missionary Studies. It's a big mouthful. Um, it is no longer an actual organization site, and I still, you know, do the work. But uh, I started this organization. We were briefly affiliated with Jews for Judaism, and then we were not. And uh, but at some point, I began to realize that the thing that gives me the most joy in this world is to build people up rather than to tear something down. And that has become my mission. Now, I'm going to finish with a story. And I always tell the story when I'm talking to Jewish people. And um, I don't know who in this audience is Jewish or not Jewish, who was born Jewish, who converted. It doesn't matter. But I'm going to tell the story anyway, OK? So the story is told of a man who is walking along the beach. And he discovers a cave. And inside the cave is a bag of rocks. And he looks at this bag, and he picks up a rock, and he says, you know, it's not very attractive. Kind of ugly, actually. And the bag is kind of heavy. It's a big burden. But 
but it's sand. I'll drag it with me. So he starts dragging the bag along with him, and he takes a rock, and he tosses it into the water, and he takes out another rock, and he tosses it into the water. He does this for hours. He's about two-thirds through the bag. One of the rocks slips out of his hand and hits a rock in the ground, and it realizes that it's not all. It's more like a lump of clay, and inside is a precious gemstone. I wonder if there's more where that came from. So he takes another one, and he breaks that on the rock, and he opens it up, and there's another precious gemstone. He goes through all of the rest of the bag's bag, and he inside every single lump of clay gemstone. Looking at his beautiful treasure, oh, so proud of himself, when suddenly it hits him. Oh, my God. If I had known what was inside that rock, those rocks, at the beginning, I would be a billionaire instead of just having a small treasure. And unfortunately, so many of us Jewish people see our Judaism like that bag of rocks. It's a big, heavy burden. And the rocks, they're, they're mitzvot. They're the commandments. And they're not very attractive, not very interesting. Some of us do them because, well, we're supposed to, but most of the rest of us just toss them into the water. So if you see your Judaism as more like that bag of rocks than the precious treasure you've been given, if you see your relationship with God as more like that bag of rocks than that precious treasure you've been given, then my challenge to you tonight is to find someone who will be that rock in the ground for you. The principle that I teach, no matter what the subject is, whether I'm teaching on business or spirituality or uh, personal growth, and that is that you need to surround yourself with people who want what you have and people who have what you want very, very important. People who want what you have remind you of the value of what you've got. But people who have what you want, they can serve as mentors for you. You know, and you know these people, they're really excited about their Judaism, about their relationship with God. Go to them. Ask them oh, hey, can we learn together? Will you share to, with me what it is that excites you about this you know will you have me for a shabbat meal or whatever right but find someone who will be that rock in the ground for you now i'm going to th thank you very much for being such an <laughs> thank you